Hello, friends and friendly faces. Um, climate change. Talk 27 is going on. I don't know if you knew, because I didn't. And I like to label myself as being environmentally minded. So honestly, I feel like I don't deserve this bio anymore because how did I not know, right? I have known for a while that I live under a rock, but at this point, I probably need to do something about this. The thing is that news at a certain point in my life caused huge spikes in my distress and anxiety, and it was very much decapitated. Decap. Decap. Decapacitating. Decapacitating. Well, as said, I would like to label myself as being environmentally minded. And sustainability, in every sense of the word, is something I would like to align myself with. But where does that show up in my social media, for example? Other than in my bio? And also in this one judgy video I made years ago. I haven't watched the video in a while, and there was an idea there. I would like to recreate the video. But I do think it was a little bit judgy and misguided. I find it difficult to talk about sustainability and climate change and the environment because it is a subject that is that has a huge impact on me and it is something that guides the decisions I make in my life but I feel like talking about it is very difficult because it is a very complex issue and it is hard to communicate the whole complexity of it and I also, when looking into it and looking into trying to talk about it, uh, I get overwhelmed by all the different variables. And it can also impair my ability to function in my daily life. Like this week, it's already Saturday. And I started this on Monday, I think. And I've not been able to do schoolwork. I've just lived in this crisis. I feel like. Anything I do, anything I could do, anything I'm capable of doing, just does not have an impact. And at the same time, any decision I make in my life, I'm overwhelmed and I feel enormous guilt about. And it's also difficult to then open yourself up and talk about this publicly, even though I want to, and it's something important to me. Because I feel like from both sides of the conversation, there is a lot of judgment going on. So it's scary, but I'm here and I want to talk about this. So in case you, like I, don't really know what COP27 is, here's what I found. Let me take a sip of water. Oops. Pour it over myself. It is the 2022 United Nations Climate Change Conference. It's the 27th such conference, hosted this time by Egypt. On their website, they say, Egypt assumes presidency of COP27 with a clear recognition of the gravity of the global climate challenge and appreciation of the value of multilateral, collective and concrete action as the only means to address this truly global threat. And one thing that keeps coming up and what this whole thing really heavily relies on is the IPCC reports. IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC prepares comprehensive assessment reports about the state of scientific, technical and socioeconomic knowledge on climate change, its impact and future risks and options for reducing the rate at which climate change is taking place. Oh, how disrespectful. My neighbor started just cutting the lawn. Honestly, so disrespectful. I hope it doesn't bother you. I hope the mic doesn't pick that up because it apparently doesn't even pick up my whistle. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, is the UN body for assessing the science related to climate change. It was established by the United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP, and the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, in 1988 to provide political leaders with periodic scientific assessments concerning climate change 
its implications and risks, as well as to put forward adaptation and mitigation strategies. IPCC assessments provide governments at all levels with scientific information that they can use to develop climate policies. IPCC assessments are a key input into the international negotiations to tackle climate change. IPCC reports are drafted and reviewed in several stages, thus guaranteeing objectivity and transparency. All this looks great, but why am I bringing this up? Like, how does this concern you and I? What can you and I take from this to apply in our own lives? You know, the COP27 website has a vision and mission page. So let's take a look at there. Each of goals and vision. Inclusive, rules-based and ambitious, substantive outcomes commensurate with the challenge based on science and guided by principles, building on agreements, decisions, pledges, and commitments from RIO 1992 to Glasgow 2021. We seek to accelerate global climate action through emissions reduction, scaled up adaptation efforts, and enhanced flows of appropriate finance. We recognize that just transition remains a priority for developing countries worldwide. That all sounds like, like, fluff. <laughs> I mean, these are the facts, but still, concrete what's going on. It's literally the PR statement every corporation and organization has on their website about their green energy, and then they push the blame on the consumers and sell you a solution that does not work. Let's read further. Mitigation. We must unite to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius and work hard to keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius target alive. This requires bold and immediate action and raising ambition from all parties, in particular those who are in a position to do so and those who can do lead by example. COP27 will be a moment for countries to fulfill their pledges and commitments towards delivering the objectives of the Paris Agreement to enhance the implementation of the Convention. This year should witness the implementation of the Glasgow Pact, call the review ambition in NDCs, and create a work program for ambition and mitigation. Okay, so 1.5 degrees Celsius versus 2 degrees Celsius. Funnily enough, the sun is bothering me. Let's try that again then. <laughs> okay, so 1.5 degrees Celsius warming versus 2 degrees Celsius. Funnily enough, this all began from me sharing this post from Ule, the leftist propaganda news site that only shares the views of well, people like me. So the post was detailing the difference between 1.5 degrees Celsius warming and 2 degrees Celsius warming, and I shared that to my private Instagram story. And then I removed that story in the early morning hours when I was reading up on this subject. I felt a little bit stupid sharing that because everyone knows it. Everyone knows the difference between 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius at this point, right? Like, no one's debating the importance of that. But concrete, what does it do other than annoy the people who know me and feel obliged to support me? I mean, climate change. You know what it is, I know what it is, we know what's going on, we know it's our fault. There, we're not arguing about that. There is no time. And one question I was pondering over is, should we abandon hope? Should we give up on that 1.5 degrees Celsius goal? According to my browse of this random study at 1am, no, because, quote, we must nurture and sustain hope if we are to meet this challenge. Their justification for the hope in the face of the climate crisis are hopeful people 
feel better than hopeless people. Hope leads to action and hope is empirically justified because according to them, there is no basis for concluding now that our fate is sealed. And according to this study, yes. Except the title is misleading because it goes into constructive hope. So, and according to this edition of The Economist, also yes. But because it's too late already and we need to start preparing for when shit hits the fan. Except the shit has already hit the fan. It has already landed. We are currently, you and I, living through the consequences of climate change. And you and I, we have it good. Like, do you know what's going on in Pakistan right now? Do you? Like, are we gonna be those frogs that just get spoiled alive because we're just sitting in this hot planet without realizing what's going on? We're already living through the consequences of climate change. And you and I, we have it good. And we're probably more responsible. We are more responsible for it. The richer countries are the ones who has the biggest climate impact, but it doesn't show up as drastically here as in the countries that don't have as big of a climate footprint as of yet. And then the responsibility is just pushed on them. So ultimately, the question of 1.5 degrees Celsius versus 2 degrees Celsius and if there is hope or no hope is irrelevant to me. Whatever motivates you, whatever you need to tell yourself so that you will actually act and not just pat yourself on the back and ignore the issue. Whatever you need to tell yourself, do that. There is no one size fits all. Ultimately, we just need to keep going because what other option is there? And whatever we need to tell ourselves to keep going, then that just works for us, right? But the thing is that I don't know what I can do or even what I should do. And that's what I want to know. I just want answers. If it was up to me, we would, of course, just be following the current consensus and the current scientific knowledge we have, right? And that gets me back to the IPCC reports. We're going in circles here. <laughs> that is the neutral scientific facts of the moment, right? Except, of course, it's politicized like everything. Okay, so we're going in circles here. Let's just get into the reports. I did go through the summary for policymakers, or summaries for policymakers. There was multiple. But I'm just a little baby scientist, and in a different field as well. I don't study the environmental sciences. I study the medical sciences, right? And I already feel quite inept in talking about these issues, right? I mean... They are for policymakers, so it's not like they were made for people who have studied these fields, but still. There's just a lot to go through, and it is a very emotional topic for me. So instead, I just decided to look for TLDR IPCC Climate Change 2022. And this is something I found. This is from Selectra. Um... Sorry guys, but y'all have typos on your page, which doesn't bode well for your credibility. I do wonder what that says about my sources, but we'll let it slide. So what is Selectra? They are a leader in energy comparison. They aim to make it easier to compare, subscribe and manage contracts in order to make the world cheaper and above all greener. They are committed to raising customers' awareness of global warming and encouraging consumers to have a positive impact on the environment. We love a green company. Um, they offer a complete range of green products and services, such as change to a green energy supplier or green energy tariff. 
They finance environmental projects through carbon credits, raise awareness among friends and family by offering carbon offset gift cards. Okay, so now we can keep their bias in mind and the issues with their business model as we read their summary. 4th of April, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change gave prominence to three special aspects. Use of fossil fuels. This kind of fuel that should be abandoned as soon as possible as a matter of urgency. We knew this. We are living through an energy crisis. So it's not very simple. The second one, change in our diet habits. The livestock industry is one of the most polluting industries in addition to all the deforestation involved in its construction and maintenance. To get into a more sustainable diet, it is necessary to be willing to reduce the demand for meat and dairy. Go vegan. You knew I was gonna tell you that, you know? You knew I was gonna push you to that direction, right? I'm gonna start, I think, preparing a like how to go vegan guide, but I'm very new to this whole thing. I have been neglecting my school, so it's not gonna be out anytime soon, but I will be linking some of my favorite resources down below so you can look into it for yourself. Greener cities. The traditional Urban organization must change as soon as possible towards sustainable and more environmentally friendly urban planning. The greener cities. Um, yes. That's all. So the question still remains, what can we do concrete, you and I, right now. Lucky for us, they have something to say about this matter. It turns out that your personal actions can also help. There are solutions you can adopt in your daily life to reduce your personal impact on the environment. Discover five ways in which you can limit your ecological footprint. 1. Opt for a greener supplier. By opting for a 100% renewable energy supplier, you Participate in a greener world while saving on your electricity bills. Adopt recycling. By giving a second life to your waste, you are actively participating in the ecological transition. Think about recycling all sorts of items, including glass, paper, cardboard, aluminium and plastic. Reduce your digital footprint. By adopting the right habits, you can limit the carbon footprint linked to the use of your electronic equipment. Choose ecological transport. By opting for public transport or an ecological means of transport, such as electric bicycle or an electric car, you can limit the environmental impact of your travels. Offset your carbon footprint. By supporting an environmental project like the Gandhi project, you are helping to limit greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So we know these recommendations come from a company that is invested in this field, right? And in these services. I would like to think that they are doing it with the right reasons, right? That they are actually trying to give the right and good solutions for us. Because that is the reason why I would personally want to get into this field, right? But it is still something to keep in our mind, especially when we talk about offsetting your carbon footprint and these kind of services, because there is a lot of issues relating to these. There is a lot of misinformation, misdirection and greenwashing words that don't mean anything or don't mean what you think they mean, like biodegradable versus compostable or carbon neutral or all the different markings in plastic or these recycling markings. It's really hard to know what they exactly mean. Or free range eggs. Um, a lot of these things I feel like are just companies pushing the responsibility into the consumers or just misdirecting people so they won't change their habits because they get exhausted by not knowing them. Or consumers just doing these things to it can be from like genuine want to do the right thing and you're misled 
by the companies and organizations. Or it can be just a quick way to try to silence your guilt of doing something you know to be against your better judgment. It's, it's a difficult field to navigate. And I'm also definitely guilty of, for example, in the aforementioned video, I was like, if you have money to travel, you have money to offset your carbon footprint. All right. Wow. It's a very complex issue, and I want to read to you specifically about the carbon offsets, for example, and the issues relating to it. So they are um, that carbon offsetting is not sustainable environmentally, economically, or socially. Environmentally, it's not sustainable because carbon offset do not work at the core issue of reducing CO2 emissions. There are not enough offset for all CO2 emissions and not all carbon offsets projects are realized. They are not sustainable economically because carbon offsets further an economic gap between the world's rich and poor. And they are not sustainable socially because carbon offsets are often used as a greenwashing and they maintain an economic gap between the world's rich and poor. Then another issue is that carbon offsetting is not ethical because carbon offsets do not work at the core issue of reducing CO2 emissions. Poorer countries are paid to offset carbon while richer countries continue to emit. Carbon offsets projects are also often used as greenwashing. And another issue is carbon offsetting is not good for the environment. Carbon offsets do not effectively reduce climate change, and there are not enough offset for all our CO2 emissions. And then different projects have different effectiveness rates. Direct CO2 removal is the most effective project category, followed by renewable energy, energy efficiency, and lastly, carbon sequestration. I don't exactly know what that is, actually. So, I feel like this is just another way to avoid the responsibility and push the responsibility on the consumers. And I think there's this tendency of us blaming ourselves and us blaming each other and judging each other. I'm definitely guilty of that too. That being said, I do still believe that we as well have a responsibility and role in all of this. We can't think that we are just such small variables that our actions don't count or that our country is so good that compared to everyone else, we're fine. Especially because we don't see the impact of our consumer habits where we live, but we see them elsewhere. And also the environmental impact of the products we use are produced somewhere else. We can look at China and think that, oh, they are so horrible for the environment, but we are paying for them to do those horrible things for the environment, right? Because our products come from there. So we are consumer habits have a environmental impact where we live, like locally, and they also have a global environmental impact. And sometimes it is not clearly communicated to the consumers. For example, if this product says that it's carbon neutral, does it take the whole production process into account or just a part of it and also sometimes we ignore that the global impact of our actions and even still for example taking finland our diet is places us in the bad guys in europe right we're a small country so our small population doesn't have as big of an impact as the other countries right but when you take the population into account our consumer habits places us at a higher place and of course there is even within finland for example there is a divide between the poorer families and what their impact is versus the richer families and what their impact is. So the question is that, again, what can we do? What is our responsibility and our impact? And I want to talk about the responsibility a little bit. I read this paper, when worry about climate change leads to climate action, how values, worry and personal responsibility relate to various climate actions. So the highlights from this study. Climate worry raises personal responsibility and thereby diverse climate actions. 
individuals who strongly endorse biospheric values worry more about climate change. Personal responsibility to reduce climate change relates to various climate actions. Biospheric values primarily relate to personal climate mitigation behaviors. Worry about climate change is primarily associated with climate policy support. So this highlights why we need to feel responsible for it and also worry about it, right? So that we support the climate policy and also take personal climate mitigation actions. This is why I think it's important to acknowledge that all of us as a collective, as well as individuals, have a role and responsibility. But then, as I've mentioned before, we get into the blame game. And that is actually something I want to read to you about as well. So, the following is from a paper titled The Blame Game. Three service teachers' views on who is responsible and what needs to be done to mitigate climate change. Climate change is a pressing and urgent problem that calls for immediate action. However, although the problem has been acknowledged by individuals, governments, and businesses, global carbon emissions have continued to increase in past decades. Since 1990 in Europe, where there has been a focus on reducing production-based emissions, there has not been a significant reduction in consumption-based emissions, despite including sustainable development as a part of their educational system. This eliminates the gap between climate change concerns and climate change mitigation progress. Though there are many reasons for this divide, one reason seems to be the lack of responsibility that individuals, governments, and businesses are willing to take. Numerous studies indicate that there is a blame game going on, where individuals, governments, and businesses tend to put the responsibility on others. For instance, several studies have shown that individuals have intergroup attribution bias, meaning that they see their own social group as less responsible for climate change than outer group. Individuals also see the government as more responsible than individuals and call for more responsibility from the business sector. Similarly, politicians see climate change mitigation as an uphill battle, as attempts to implement new policies may be hindered by industries and other governments with vested interest. Politicians may also feel tied down due to policies made by previous governments, as well as social factors, such as cultural norms. Businesses also put responsibility on others, as they may feel that consumers are not aware enough of green products and are not willing to pay a high enough price for them. Businesses may also feel that the government should give more subsidies to support green production. Though there may be some truth in all these views, they do tend to be biased and deflect responsibility. Therefore, to rephrase George Arwell's 1945 famous quote from Animal Farm, it seems that the underlying notion of climate change responsibility is that we are all responsible, but some are more responsible than others. Or more bluntly, we are all responsible, but others are more responsible than us. If such a notion does indeed exist, it does not bode well for climate change mitigation, and it means that climate change education needs to examine how such a deflection of responsibility could be avoided. I took a little bit of a break. I um, made some food watched some Love is Blind and I tried to create a little bit of a relaxed atmosphere for our conversation here. Um, some candles on. I have now hot chocolate as well as coffee with me here. Um, so let's relax. You know, let's, let's just, let's relax together, right? Get your hot chocolate, get your coffee, your sparkling water that came in a plastic bottle. Uh, <laughs> let's get back into it. Back where we were. Um, where were we actually? Mm -hmm. I think I am guilty of this type of thinking. I think it can be difficult to know when what we're doing is all that we can do. And it's just a... Uh, a reality or a healthy way to protect ourselves from the decapitating, de decapacitating. That doesn't sound like a word anymore. 
Decapitate. I don't know a synonym in English for this. Decapitate. Ha. Ha. See dating. Decapitate. You know, I love the fact and the idea of the drinks and I always want to sit next to a drink. It's kind of difficult to drink when you're supposed to talk. And also I hate the sound of me breathing probably into the mic and also the sound from my mouth, you know, like swallowing and things like that. Sorry if you hear that. Um... Yeah, I definitely can recognize this way of thinking and this study um, worded it much better than I could. It is hard to talk about a topic like this. It's just difficult, is what I'm trying to get at in so many different ways. One being that I feel inept talking about these matters. I don't have the answers and it's such a complex issue with so many different perspectives. It's really hard to communicate all of those. I also get so easily overwhelmed. As I said, I can't see the forest from the trees. No, the trees from the forest. Forest from the threes. <laughs> there are so many people that are so much better at vocalizing these issues and the urgency of them. There are people who have studied specifically this field. Um, people with actual platforms. I don't know what me adding my own train wreck of a thought process helps. It's just adding noise out there that what value does this bring to anyone? For a long time, it's something I wanted to talk about, but I'm scared to share about it because I feel like from both sides of the conversation, anything I say will be picked apart. And the people who watch me right now, my friends and my family, I don't want to annoy them, you know, the question of what value does this bring to anyone? If I'm just making them feel worse and they feel obliged to watch this to support me, you know? You hear it often said that anything you can do from your phone is not activism, right? It's just performative activism, right? So I'm scared to talk about the matters that matter to me, that are important to me, because I'm scared to get something wrong. Or I'm scared that what I'm doing is actually not helping. All I want to know, all I want to do is to know what I could do. That sentence didn't make sense. All I would want is to know what to do to actually help. And that's, I literally looked that up. What can I do? And I got this video. And watching this video, the person talking seems so knowledgeable. And I'm thinking, why am I even writing my video? What use is it for me to add my own vomit there? This person is more organized. They're better spoken. They have a platform. And I was still watching the video and anything they were listing, I was like, okay, but what can I do? You're saying, you know, community, 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 it's the answer. And sure. I don't find that one so easy either. I'm also told all the things... I don't know, this is getting weird. I'm told that the changes I have made in my personal life or the values that guide my decision-making process doesn't matter. It doesn't have an impact. But we can't all think that way. Still, it feels like I'm not doing enough. There has to be something more I could do. And the community aspect of it, I can sign petitions, I don't really see anything coming from that. I'd like to join organizations. I could at least be an extra hand for someone else's cause who actually 
has a vision, has a direction, right? But finding that community isn't that easy either. Actually, there was this program from WWF Belgium. I wish I could have joined. I couldn't. But they have limited resources as well of what I can do. And with this philanthropic work, we also know that there is some bad ways to do that. Like going to a different country to build a well is not the right way to go about it. That again is just people from richer countries buying a trip that just makes them feel better about themselves doesn't actually it would be better if you gave those communities the money and you know the education went there and they learned to build those wells themselves that would first of all they would get the knowledge secondly those wells don't even last they're not a permanent solution (laughs) or you donate your clothes And does it actually help? It can just end up as trash and waste in a country that doesn't have the system in place to take care of that trash. Or the people there who previously would fix clothes or would make and sell them, now they are out of a job. Or the wanting to offset your carbon footprint. And many of those organizations also not working or just just being misdirected or even bad. It's hard to find the organization and community that you can actually do the right through which you can collectively do that right change. And sometimes even if you want to join the action, you can't. So I'm still left asking, what can I do? Just what can I do? There tends to be this all or nothing kind of mentality that Both sides, again, view you as a hypocrite for the decisions that you make, instead of viewing it as what it most likely is, just ignorance or a difference of opinion. Like, it's not like there is only one right answer. And the all or nothing kind of mentality, I feel like I also push that on myself. There's, of course, just the exhaustion of only bad choices and so many different variables that it can be really difficult to make decisions and then you just get overwhelmed and you just go with what you know. If there is no right answer or if everything is a battle to do so much research, every single decision turns into a research paper, a never-ending flood of problems that you can't address. The issue is, or what I think, is that the critique from every which direction especially from the community itself can turn people away from it there tends to be this all or nothing kind of mentality from both sides and i do also think that i impose that on myself not in just in the sense that i'm a hypocrite or selfish or just a bad person but even when going vegan i was vegetarian i've been vegetarian for a really long time Um, I tried going vegan for like a week in my teens, but I think I used that as a, ooh, like, I'm not extreme, vegans are extreme, no, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm reasonable, right, I'm just a vegetarian, right, then later I moved to live live on my own, and I, (laughs) I found actually eggs disgusting, I just started, like, really finding them exotic, I just started finding them really disgusting, and I didn't want to eat them. Um, but I did still consume, like, uh, probably eggs in baked goods, or and milk products as well, dairy products. Um, and I don't think I would have gone vegan if it wasn't for my big sister, who was just like, you know, let's, let's try it, let's just go vegan. And I was like... No, like, I can't go vegan. Um, I liked eating mozzarella sticks, specifically mozzarella sticks. And I was like, you know, maybe ate them, like, once a year uh, when I ate out. And I was like, and that's the reason I can't go vegan. And then my sister was like, okay, just go vegan. But if you feel like it and you're out, eat mozzarella sticks. But other than that, just 
try out. Like, how long could we go as vegan? You know, and I was like, okay, fully expecting it'll last like two months and be a struggle. It was a really easy change to make. Of course, I was vegetarian first, but again, it was this never in my, f like, I didn't realize to think, okay, I can go vegan except when it goes to those mozzarella sticks. Just because one thing is difficult for me to do doesn't mean I shouldn't do the things that are easy for me to do. But it can also be difficult in that a lot of people have this mentality that, well, if you're not all in, you're actively doing something bad. And then it's this divide that then anything you do and want to do and then you can do, that since it's seen as like, well, you still do all these bad things, you would have to constantly face that criticism, doing those things that you can do. So it's easier to just ignore the whole issue and keep going like you've gone forever, right? So in that too, I'm scared that I might turn people away from the subject. It's also scary because it is something that is extremely important to me and that has a huge impact on my life and my mental health. And there are people who like to just take the piss and they can say ridiculous things and you hear the same things over and over and over and over. Like, where do you get protein? Like, we get it. You get it. But since being like 12, I've grown up hearing that sometimes daily. And people can say ridiculous things. And I get emotionally invested because it is so close to my heart. But to them, it's not. Or they use you as or their dislike of one specific person who has the same values as you do as a reason to just feel good about not caring, you know? So it's scary to try to share something so important when you are so invested. Yeah, and there's a lot of things I haven't done because of also the pressure you put on yourself to do everything right or wanting to do these changes overnight. And as I said, one thing that I said a lot is that anything you can do from your phone is not activism. But the question is, what can I do? Signing petitions, sending emails, this video. I'm doing all of it from my phone. And the question of like performative activism and being scared of just it being that surface level. Obviously, I'm doing this because I want to have an impact. But again, the question, what can I do? I feel like I feel like everything I do, everything I can do, everything I have the skill set or capability of doing just does not have an impact. And trying to look for the community, yeah, it's not so easy to find the organization. And with that, also, other organizations like Extension Rebellion or something, I'm scared to join because of the implications it could have for my future if it comes out. But <laughs> if we don't take action, what future will there be? I do think if there is any kind of future, obviously... Extension Rebellion is going to be on the right side of history. And we are going to look back and view them as the heroes who <laughs> broke laws even to do things. Like, are there things where it's justified to break the law? I guess that's a different conversation that can also get dangerous really fast. And even other organizations like Greenpeace, I've considered joining. And it's still viewed as negative. People say that these organizations are so unorganized. They don't get anything done. Or they support, some of them do support things that I don't subscribe to. Does it mean I can't join them? Or does it mean if I take part in their, it's a big organization. If I take part in their activities but i don't believe in that i don't vote according to one detail like has something you don't agree with can i not then join the organization without people thinking that i subscribe to all those 
same ideas. Yeah, and as said, I do try to send emails to politicians or political parties or government organizations, but again, I'm told by some people that it doesn't matter when it feels like it doesn't matter. And sometimes also it feels so stupid that you're so invested in something and you feel the urgency of it and you send so many emails for so many different people. I was feeling stupid about it. And then you don't even get a response back or you get an automated answer or you get like a PR statement after they've already voted or done the thing you were speaking against in your email. I'd love to talk to you about another study. Lessons for climate policy from behavioral biases toward COVID-19 and climate change risks. The COVID-19 pandemic exposes the fragility of our globalized society to shocks originating from the natural system and raises fundamental concerns about the sustainability of our way of living. It also reveals how population growth, urbanization, globalization, and mass travel result in a complex externality with far-reaching global impact. Parallels are frequently drawn with another global externality, namely climate change. Striking similarities exist between both problems in terms of causes, such as unsustainable transport and food systems, and consequences, including health risks. In addition, both COVID-19 and climate change disproportionately affect deprived communities, thereby intensifying world inequalities. At this moment, we are of course experiencing other issues other than the pandemic as well. I think this paper is very interesting and it also raises points that has previously uh, impacted me in that it has stopped me for example, talking about these matters. And also, at the same time, it highlights reasons as to why we should or how we should approach these situations, right? One uh, very interesting point, in my opinion, from this paper is the finite pool of worry bias that they talk about. The finite pool of worry hypothesis states that when concerns about one issue increases, concerns about other issues decrease because individuals only have a limited pool of emotional resources. This theory has been used to explain the strong decline in worry about climate change after major events such as 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis where respectively Worries about national security and the economic situation prevailed. I think this paper brings out some very interesting topics and theories and biases that we have and that have impacted me in like being too scared to share my thoughts. Uh, definitely the final pool of worry bias, for example, has previously stopped me from wanting to talk about these issues. It never seems like there is a good time to talk about it. I remember when I started making, like wanting to put out more content and talking about climate change and veganism, the Black Lives Movement was really, like they had a lot of momentum going on for them and it felt wrong to talk about the climate issues at the time, but I definitely was too scared to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm too scared to talk about even climate change related issues. And now, of course, there is the energy crisis. Um, that kind of ties into the climate issues, right? There is, <laughs> oh, the war, there's war, in Ukraine, but I mean, like there's so many issues, it's like, despite of how scared I am to talk about climate change related issues or veganism, um, veganism honestly, like compared to these other issues, seems like a very like tame subject matter, right? Um, 
The lessons, as they say, is the challenge for climate action emerging from behavioral biases, which are the before-mentioned finite pool of worry theory or bias, uh, the simplification bias, which implies that individuals view the likelihood of the low likelihood high-impact events as falling below their threshold level of concern and fail to take the risk reduction measures unless they experience the impacts of the disasters according to the availability bias. Then there is myopia. I don't know how to say that. Maybe I should have looked that up. Myopia which has the effect that individuals insufficiently value the future benefits from actions that reduce risks from climate change, which also applies to politicians according to not-in-my-term-of-office bias. And lastly, the herding bias, which signifies that individuals mimic a lack of preparedness for risk observed from others. And then the paper goes into suggesting how to work with instead of against these biases. For example, addressing the simplification and availability biases necessitate the development of communication strategies that stress the consequences of risks associated with climate change to ensure that individuals start paying attention. Such strategies should be carefully designed to limit cognitive dissonance by, for example, using constructive framings and personalizing climate issues so they are perceived as less distant. Climate communication strategies that emphasize health risks in particular may be effective in enhancing support for climate policy. The myopia and not in my term of office biases make citizens and decision makers focus on near term risks, which at the time of writing this paper was COVID 19. By contrast, long-term risks such as climate change gain insufficient attention. They suggest that this lack of climate action could be overcome by linking policies and measures that are currently adopted to limit the risks from pandemics to actions that also reduce the risks from climate change. Such policies can be explored in various domains, as several causes of COVID-19 are also drivers of climate change such as unsustainable transport, tourism, and food systems. Hence, future action to prevent a new pandemic could also help to combat climate change, and vice versa. Moreover, climate change itself could increase the spread of infectious diseases. This further implies that climate mitigation policies can be promoted as pandemic prevention policies, thus making a stronger case for their implementation. Communicating the link between these two risks to the public might help with maintaining support for climate policies. The COVID-19 crisis has convincingly demonstrated that societies can adapt quickly and individuals can change aspects of their lifestyle if an imminent threat occurs. Hence, achieving behavioral changes that mitigate climate change might be more within reach than previously thought. Honestly, at this point, I could just read the whole paper. Maybe it would have been a better approach to this video. Um, they also meant, mentioned the herding bias and also like what actions from the governments and whatnot and the other. So my main takeaway from this one is that I will um, start sharing more stuff relating to climate change and veganism and hope that it brings some value to someone and I hope to play into that sheeple mindset uh, or be a visible part of that magic number. The tipping point of 25% to reverse social convention. Honestly, maybe it's already like um, changing, reversing, because with my time, I have seen massive changes, especially in people's views about plant-based diets. It's gone from that extreme, weird, illogical thing to being like, everyone's like, yeah, I've reduced my consumption of animal products and yeah, we should reduce it. And also there's so many more vegetarian and vegan options, right? 
So I have definitely seen the change in that. I think the change happened earlier in Finland, but I do think it took a little bit longer there. And I think after I've moved to Belgium, the change has happened here too. And it has happened during the period of time that I've lived here. And it's happened much faster here, I think, than in Finland. So that's also like positive. That's also just my experience on it. Obviously, as you grow older, you perceive time differently. So I'm sure the change happened later here, but maybe it just felt like a longer period when I was living in Finland. I want to be part of that 3.5%. You know, that's even better. Even better odds. <laughs> um, I will definitely, definitely um, be joining more marches. Actually, this year I went to my first Pride. I wanted to post a video about that too. This is like my first year being out. Um, like, out, out. So, <laughs> celebration. Um. <laughs> Let's just get to the actions already. Um, so what are these? Specific climate mitigation behaviors. The paper mentions final call to save the world from climate catastrophe from McGrath from 2018. So I just looked that up and what I caught is an article. It says, it's the final call, say scientists, in the most extensive warning yet on the risks of rising global temperatures. Their dramatic report on keeping the rise under 1.5 degrees Celsius says the world is now completely off track, heading instead towards 3 degrees Celsius. Scientists might want to write in capital letters, ACT NOW IDIOTS, but they need to say that with facts and numbers. I mean, I'd love to act if you just told me what to do. That's what we're here for, right? What can I do? What can you do? Oh, <laughs> I guess they do go into more specific actions then. The report says there must be rapid and significant changes in four big global systems. Energy, land use, cities, industry. But it adds that the world cannot meet its targets without changes by individuals. Urging people to buy less meat, milk, cheese and butter and more locally sourced seasonal foods and to throw less of it away. Drive electric cars but walk or cycle short distances. Take trains and buses instead of planes. Use video conferencing instead of business travel. Use a washing line instead of tumble dryer. Insulate homes. Demand low carbon in every consumer product. My, my tree drinks and my mouth still feels dry. Lifestyle changes can make a big difference, said Dr. Debra Roberts, the IPC's other co-chair. We got back to the IPCC. This was from the IPCC. This is probably more, um, I don't know, it looks like a more credible source than the earlier one, but I'm not excluding that. I want to go in circles. Okay. Lifestyle changes can make a big difference, said Dr. Debra Roberts, the IPC's other co-chair. That's a very empowering message for the individual, she said. This is not about remote science. It's about where we live and work. And it gives us a cue on how we might be able to contribute to that massive change. Because everyone is going to have to be involved. We love that quote. You might say you don't have control over land use, but you have control over what you eat, and that determines land use. Facts. We can choose the way we move in cities, and if we don't have access to public transport, make sure you're electing politicians who provide options around public transport. Okay, let's just get to the conclusions, I suppose. What was the point in this whole ramble? <laughs> um, I guess we'll just see what comes from the COP27 meeting. Um, honestly, as said before, I just keep flip-flopping between 
the desperation and hopelessness and feeling like nothing's happening and between things have changed people know about this and people care about this things are happening I also keep flip-flopping between there's nothing I can do, anything I do does not have an impact, and between, oh, well, here are some simple things that I can do and I'm already doing, between, like, there's, I'm not doing anything, I'm not doing enough, and between, oh, I'm doing something, like, this is a pretty big thing. But I don't know that if everyone did what I do, it would be enough. There are definitely things I'll be doing differently going forward. Yeah, like I saw this title, for example, very recent article from Greenpeace saying Finland will achieve carbon neutrality by 2035 and aims to be the world's first fossil-free welfare society. I won't get too much into it because it's just another side tangent and this is long enough. Living outside of Finland or just growing up, my view of Finland has changed drastically. I think a lot of us just like to pat ourselves in the back and think, you know, we are not the problem. You know, compared to others, we're doing fine. But in a lot of ways, we aren't. And even I personally know people who have such oddly, drastically different views on these matters. Like, I was raised in an environment that was quite openly racist and quite openly homophobic, and I was also put down for my values and speaking, voicing my opinions, even if my opinions are stupid, just the way it was handled. So in that, in my personal life, in my close circle, I know people with such different views that think they are so educated when they're just stuck in a very old way of thinking that even back then was not reflecting the current science. So that was one good news. Yeah, it went into how the Finland school is founded in science and like how our emotions has lowered. But the thing is as well that it's hard to sometimes know what everything is taken into account because we can say for example this product like we will offset the carbon footprint but as we established it isn't that simple and if there isn't enough transparency this didn't give me good enough picture about how exactly it's happening and also in some ways uh, we've taken step back in Finland specifically. First of all, our diets, as established earlier, are very taxing for the environment. But another thing, the sustainable forest industry that we supposedly have, like right now, we've turned into a negative impact, right? So in some ways, we've taken steps back. So it's hard to know what exactly is taken into account and what the situation is actually like. There is so much more I could say, but let's just get to, you know, the takeaway, right? Here's a list of things that I came up with. Uh, I want to reiterate that I don't have the answers. I'm not the most well-versed in this. And um, yeah, if you know more than I do, if you have suggestions of things that I could do, we could do, please share them. If I got something wrong, to correct me. If you have questions, you can ask them and I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. You can also contact me directly via Instagram if you don't want to, you know. Uh, yeah, so things, actions you could take. Um, number one, I think you should personally read up on climate change. There was a lot of things that were new to me and a lot of things that I rediscovered. And I think knowledge is really important when it comes to any issue, right? Because it'll guide our behavior, right? We don't necessarily know everything like that impacts something, right? So reading up on it could help us see these situations in our everyday life. So when we're voting or at our workplace or school uh, or even the grocery store, we can actually see situations and understand like the broader picture of it and also see situations that we think, oh, uh, this could be done differently or we'll be able to ask better questions. 
I think we can have a big impact in our immediate environment and in our immediate social group. And it does matter. It, it genuinely does. Uh, my sister, actually, again, she's done so much in her own workplace. Like, she organized this, like, plastic recycling system. Even though I think they should have had that in place already. Similarly, in her workplace, she, for example, put this sign up next to this um, drinking fountain that this many cups are thrown away from this specific fountain every day or every week and you could have an option to take a reusable mug right or reuse the same mug that you take not always throw it out right and i think if enough people did those things i think it could honestly have an impact and there's probably so many different situations where we see that where we could come up with a better solution or we could impact our immediate environment and the people around us then of course sending emails either sending your individual emails or these different letter campaigns like amnesty has them for human rights right there's a very well-known example for example yeah and you can send them to like anywhere it doesn't have to only be politicians or your representatives it can also be um the government it can be like the grocery store actually Again, the same sister, she, very recently, there is a uh, Lihaton Lokaku in Finland, like meatless October. And during that time, a grocery store that she frequents only posted products about like the meat section and bread sometimes, you know? And she contacted them and said, hey, it's meatless October, like, could you showcase some of your vegan or vegetarian products? And they actually did. And that's yet another way, like, it actually can have an impact. I will also continue sending emails, even though it is frustrating sometimes. But I do think there's a few things, like the recycling system here is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I just kind of gave up on that, even though I'm really frustrated about the situation and it impacts me daily. So I do think after this, I will get back to trying to see what I can do about that, right? Maybe now is a great time to send an email about that with the COP27 going on, right? I mean, it is frustrating because I sometimes get absolutely shit answers. Like Becca Harvista. I've sent so many emails to this guy. I don't like him anymore. Even though way back when I probably would have voted for him in the presidential elections. Of course, I, as every Finn, has fallen in love with Nini Sturgis. You know, we have daddy issues. So any daddy man like Nienista will win our hearts, right? I don't even know anything. I don't know if I should like Nienista. I don't know anything about the guy other than his wife might have bought underwear and put them in a bag. <laughs> Little of the press. Okay. The third one is joining an environmental group or mailing list. Um, as I said, that can be difficult too. You could also get like gifts. Christmas is coming up. You could get non-materialistic gifts. A lot of organizations offer that as well. Or you could follow them on social media like WWF or something. And even if you feel like you don't have the time or will to join an organization, maybe if you follow them on social media, you might see something that might have value for you, might inspire you to do something or try something or make a change. Then, obviously, go vegan. Did you think I wouldn't try to push that down your throat a little bit more? Just go vegan. I feel like it's such a big impact change you can make in your personal life that you have control over and you know it's something you can do. You know it has an impact. Like it's something so concrete you can do and you can do it. So that's what's so satisfying about it. I will be making a video about like my tips on how to go vegan. Um, but that will probably take a moment. I mean, I'm very <laughs> new to this whole thing. I'm not very professional when it comes to YouTube, right? Um, I also don't think I'm the best source when it comes to that, but I will link some of my favorite sources. So they will either be on the description or in the comments. So do check them out if you're interested. And as I said, doing something imperfectly is better than not doing it. So. Give it a consideration and if you have to eat those mozzarella sticks when you go out, eat the mozzarella sticks.
then of course sign petitions that's an easy one i think then go to the protests and marches um be that 3.5 percent biggie backing off of that be that 25 percent and strive to make that change within your own bubble i suppose you know talk about these issues show these issues share them with the people in your life and on your social media i'm definitely gonna be doing that you know say who may that it's just keyboard activism or performative activism at least it showcases your values and your struggles and maybe someone can relate to it maybe it can have an impact on someone's life right I am worried about annoying the people who know me, um, who just feel obliged to watch this and support me trying to do social media, because I don't want to be annoying. And I say after a long ass video of me. <laughs> then another one is to be mindful about your food waste and waste in general and recycling and be mindful of what you eat you know eating locally sourced products and in general consuming locally produced products and as said earlier um choosing low carbon footprint products right walk by use the train or bus and being mindful of your consumer habits like wearing new clothes a hundred times or being mindful where they come from and um, trying to maintain and fix the product that you already have. Reduce, reuse, recycle. That's the order. And then, of course, voting. That feels like such a lame one. But there's a lot of elections coming up everywhere. There's actually very important elections going in US, I think. I hate how America-centric everything is, right? Um, yeah, there's important elections coming everywhere. And it's hard to know who to vote, right? But... Uh, you should be in contact with your representatives. Like, where's the harm? They are there to represent you, right? And ask those questions and vote with that in mind. I mean, it does feel very anticlimactic and it feels like nothing, right? We are voting already, I hope. Not vote. Belgium, actually, you have to vote, which I like that. I, get, I think you get fined if you don't vote, so. just vote it's a very complex issue and i definitely think the community aspect is very important and it's difficult always like what is the indiv individual's responsibility and what are the actual concrete ways an individual can have an impact so definitely trying to work as a collective is important but i also think it's important in that I think it's important to have people around you who understand what you're going through. And in that, I feel extremely lucky in that I have my sisters who I think genuinely understand the distress and the worry and anxiety, the gravity of it all. I think it's sometimes very difficult to talk to people about it um, because I think if you can't relate to it, it's hard to know the depth of it and the and the complexity of the issues, right? And people's reactions can feel very invalidating in a way. And also, it can feel like you're putting other people in a difficult situation. It can also be very difficult to have people in your life that you care about, that care about you, that you know to be intelligent, educated, and caring people if they don't subscribe to your values or they don't like live according to them when you when if they care about you and they see how it impacts you and you know how intelligent they are and they might know your arguments in and out but still it doesn't impact them in the same way it impacts you it can be a very difficult thing to navigate so in that sense it's also very important to have people around you who understand it well that's all. Um, I hope I can go back to studying tomorrow. I don't know. I have so many hours of content. I probably have to edit this forever. Um, I have been neglecting my studies for this past week really hard. The topic is very complex. And even after this long ramble, I feel like I have so much more I could say and so much more I would want to say.
I will be making content around sustainability and veganism, as I said. And hopefully they'll be more lighthearted than this one. Um, so stay tuned for that if you're interested. Yeah, I hope you got something out of this. And I really appreciate you watching it. And as I said, you can contact me on Instagram or in the comments. If you do decide to say something, just please be respectful for everyone involved. We are trying to share a planet here. I think I want to end this with reiterating the importance of the community aspect and how incredibly lucky I am with my sisters. I feel like really understand me. <laughs> and I'd want to read a part of their answers to when I asked them that what I right now concrete could do to help the climate crisis. They did give me some concrete answers and they are quite well integrated in this as well. There were other ones too, like studying, obviously. They're both studying something in the environmental field right now. I feel like maybe I'm in the wrong field. Um, but my big sister actually first thing asked me if my question came from distress or just in general wanting to know. And, um, and I said distress and she said that to distress it doesn't help to list off things that would help that it can just magnify the distress but that still she doesn't just want to say that things will work out and that we still have hope and i actually really appreciate that because i don't think that would make me feel better i would not believe that and i would feel like that's just in a way invalidating my fears and negating my emotions that it would be ignoring the just the desperation to do something. Yeah, it would feel like it would just be telling that I'm in the wrong to worry. Not to worry, right? It doesn't take it away. Just because you ignore a problem doesn't mean it isn't there, right? Yeah. As I said, uh, my sister asked if my question came from distress or just casual wanting to know, right? And when I said distress, she said, you need to know there are others who are also in distress. You are not alone. You should look for these people and do something, even if it doesn't save anything. You'll feel better, but you need to do it together. You need to accept this situation. We are here and we are going somewhere. It can be nothing happens before it's too late, but you tried. You acknowledged. You can be sad. It's okay. After the stress, you can be sad. Then you can consider if those who deny, don't acknowledge, or believe that the situation can change, if they are happier than you, I don't know, someday the distress comes to them too. Then think about things you enjoy. This is one of those horrible moments when you can think that somewhere people's homes are ruined and they can't get clean water because of climate change. Life is not fair. But for me, things are well. And that I grieve and sit in distress doesn't help anyone. But it wastes what I have, despite it all, to negative. And things that help me with distress, read about circular economy. We'd have so many solutions if we just start using them. Listen to interviews from Leo Stranis. Usually it makes me feel better. And my other sister said um, that we are here to leave. So even if our reality doesn't reach that ideal balance, the green utopia society, we also get to enjoy the time we have here. Even to see the world and experience its temporary beauty. In the end, the influence of a single person is equally small, both negative and positive. In the worst of times, I succumb to existential nihilism. We are insignificant stardust in the great mystical and unknown universe. And in the end, the troubles of our world are completely insignificant compared to the universe according to our current knowledge. <laughs>